sports stories from inside the historic and unprecedentedly ugly 2016 election. For the first time together, just the two of them, both campaign managers, Trump's Kellyanne Conway. Everybody wants to go back in a time machine so that this result that nobody saw coming won't come somehow. And Clinton's Robbie Mook. We came very close to winning this campaign. We won the popular vote. They take us behind the curtain and reveal the strategies. What sealed the deal for Trump's historic win? Who was able to tap into the angst and the frustration of job holders? What caused Clinton's defeat? The director of the FBI sent two letters, total breach of protocol. Without those letters, we would have won. Plus the campaign's biggest surprises. This was the most overhyped, overreported, over-litigated story in the history of American politics. Including Trump's infamous Access Hollywood tape. That incident affected Donald Trump's numbers significantly. A deep dive with the man and woman running the campaigns. Our exclusive interview on a special State of the Union starts right now. Hello, I'm Jake Tapper in Washington, where the state of our union is still quite divided. Almost one month after Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton, officials from both campaigns are still raw and emotional, bitter and angry, more offended than introspective. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, while Donald Trump easily surpassed the 270 electoral votes needed to win the White House. So today, we're going to bring you something rarely seen both major presidential campaign managers sitting together doing a joint interview discussing how we got here. A conversation both enlightening and contentious. Trump's Kellyanne Conway and Clinton's Robbie Mook each dedicated their lives to the singular task of seeing the other have a bad night in November. I sat down with them at Harvard University's Institute of Politics to go behind the scenes of one of the most unprecedented and ugly campaigns in modern history. Robbie, I know there are a lot of people here, especially here at Harvard, who are wondering what happened? What went wrong? Uh, obviously Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and she won more votes for president than any white man in history, um, but this is obviously a race to 270 and she came up short in traditionally democratic states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. She told donors not long after the election that she thought the, the letter from FBI Director James Comey uh, was really the nail in the coffin for her. Do you agree? Is that is that what went wrong? Well, look, we are really proud uh, of her margin in the popular vote. Uh, and But as you said, this was about electoral college uh, votes, and we did come up short. Um, we felt very good about where we were going into the last 10, 20 days of the election. Uh, I think it is hard to imagine the kind of impact that that letter uh, had. Um, uh, you know, most of the public polling showed a distinct drop. We certainly saw that in our uh, internal numbers, and particularly because the letter didn't really seem to have much of a purpose. He, he said he had some emails, he hadn't seen them, he didn't really know what they were. Um, so, look, when you look across those three states that you mentioned that we lost, we're talking about 100,000 votes, anything could have made a difference with, with such small margins, less than 1% in each of those states. But, but we do think that that was an incredibly powerful uh, force in the race. You know, the other reality is, uh, you know, we were hoping for stronger performance in some sectors, and a lot of the data was very off in this race. So we're, we have to reflect on all of those reasons. Um, What's but, that, what sectors? Well, uh, we were uh, expecting to perform better with uh, suburban women in particular. We saw those numbers a lot stronger than what happened on uh, Election Day. We do think that was because uh, of the Comey letter. Um, uh, we saw a lot of young people go to third party candidates. We think the letter had a lot to do with that as well. So there were a number of reasons for this, but uh, lead among them in my view would be that letter from Director Comey. And Kellyanne, you said that, you, that, the, that the shift, the movement towards Donald Trump and away from Hillary Clinton among undecided voters and some of these key demographic Group started before the Comey letter came out. Yes, and you even see the public polls that reflected what we were seeing internally, Jake. For example, ABC News released a poll on a Sunday that said 50-38. We really didn't believe that she was at 50. We knew we were not under 40. But everybody then had to live with that 12-point poll because people held it up as evidence that the race was over, that there was no way Hillary Clinton could lose, no way Donald Trump could win. And by Friday of that same week, it was a one-point race. And that was uh, 
before the Comey letter. Also, Secretary Clinton herself, the night of the day the Comey letter was released on October 28th, said at her rally that she, it didn't matter because Americans had already decided what they thought about the emails and that they, it was already baked in the cake. And this was a messaging point from her campaign. So at the time they said that maybe it was wishful thinking, maybe they weren't being completely truthful. And now it's, it's supposed to be the Comey letter. And, and I have to say, you know, Donald Trump turned over 200 counties that went for President Obama in 2012 to Donald Trump in 2016. That's because of messages that connect with people in those areas, not because of a letter late in the game. Um, I do think that it probably had an effect on some voters. But if you want to reach suburban women, and the question is, you're the first female president running for, your first female running for president as a party nominee, then why is the message not really connected to them? I want to get to messaging in a little bit, but let's back up to June 2015. Donald Trump comes down uh, the escalator at Trump Tower, announces uh, that he's going to run for president. It seemed back in the primaries that many people in your campaign, Robbie, wanted Donald Trump to be the nominee, that you thought he would be easier to beat than, say, Marco Rubio. Is that true, and why? I think many uh, Democrats did believe that. I think uh, uh, obviously our opinions on that changed as he progressed through the primary and was very successful by any standard uh, in that primary. And Kellyanne, you've been very critical of the polls, so let me give you an opportunity to, to weigh in on a rare moment of agreement here. <laughs> Why were the polls so wrong? I'm critical of the polls just because well, they I, own a place, I own a place <laughs> called The Polling Company and I never want to practice law again, so I, I can't be that critical of the polls. But the polls, the polls are wrong for a couple of reasons. And when I say the polls, let's be very clear, these are mostly the public polls. So I think Joel Benenson's work, the internal polls, our, our polling work, we had five different polling firms working on including my firm. Um, we, those don't really see the light of day. We're using those for internal strategic positioning. We're not trying to get clicks or make headlines or call the race over before it is one way or the other. I think a few things happened. One is presuming that the 2012 electorate would be the 2016 electorate. And that also presumed implicitly, Jake, that Secretary Clinton would be able to attract and knit together and indeed keep together what's called the, the Obama coalition. So a a critical mass of voters of color, of millennials, um, and, and maybe even her running up the totals a little bit among women, since she's the first female candidate. And she was running a decidedly reach out to women as an anti-Trump message campaign to the very end. So I think that was a failing. The other failing is in presuming that people who had voted Democratic in the past would do so here, which is slightly different than the Obama coalition. We thought in our modeling that the 2016 electorate had a better chance of, of loosely resembling the 2014 electorate in some of these key states and counties, which was my obsession, the counties, than, than it would resemble the 2012 election. And so we talked, I talked very publicly, very early on, under a hail of criticism about the undercover Trump voter. And it was very real. And the undercover Trump voter, to put, put it all to rest, this is not somebody who's afraid to say they're voting for Donald Trump. That's not what it is. It's somebody who just doesn't look like a Trump voter. They, it's a union household that's voted Democratic for years. It's, it's a single mom who couldn't possibly dream of voting for Donald Trump. Why would she do that when she can vote for Hillary Clinton, who's, quote, fighting for women and children? And so we, we just took an approach where we were a little bit more open-minded about who the electorate may be and allowed them to tell us who they were. Look, turnout wasn't what we wanted it to be in some places. Uh, and there were different stories across different states. You know, Philadelphia did turn out the way we would have liked. Other, uh, other states weren't. But one thing I think we did see across the country, I think Kellyanne would agree with this, was we did see record uh, Hispanic turnout in a number yes. of communities. I think that was important to our win in Nevada and Colorado. Um, and that's why Texas, I think, was a lot closer than many people anticipated. Obviously, that wasn't uh, you know, enough for us to win the election. Um, but I think that is something to be celebrated and lifted up. Uh, that was unprecedented. And you know, I hope that those voters uh, continue to turn out. Welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. Donald Trump took the Republican primaries by storm, using his celebrity and business background to propel him to the top of the polls almost from the start. But it was his controversial campaign promises that made the headlines. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives 
can figure out what the hell is going on. Kellyanne Conway was allied with Ted Cruz during the primaries, but in July, she joined the Trump campaign as a pollster. By August, he had elevated her to campaign manager. She and campaign chair Steve Bannon seemed to be able to get Trump to be more focused, to be more disciplined. The campaign seemed to scale back some of his most provocative proposals. How did they do it? How important was that to his ultimate victory? I asked her to take us behind the scenes. We're named campaign manager August 17th, the same day that Steve Bannon was named campaign CEO. It seemed as though, from the outside, you and Steve Bannon were able to convince Donald Trump to be more disciplined in a way that previous campaign managers uh, had not convinced him to do, had not succeeded in getting through to him. Please stay on message, please stick with your teleprompter. Not that he only stuck with his teleprompter, but the kind of, one might call them self-inflicted wounds, you called them, your, your campaign calls them that with the Clinton campaign, but some of the gaffes, some of the more controversial statements he made, most of them took place disproportionately before you and Steve Bannon took over. And I'm wondering, what did you and Steve Bannon say to him to convince him we're, we will take over, but you really need to listen to us in terms of staying more on message. When we came on board, there were a couple of things. Um, I said, I don't really divulge private conversations, but I feel confident in telling you that. I said to Mr. Trump, you know, you're running against one of the most joyless presidential candidates in history, it seemed to me. Um, so why don't we not be that way as a campaign? Why don't we find a way to be the happy warrior again? He loved doing the rallies. He loved connecting with people that way. So you have to know who your candidate is. And there is no substitute for a quality, compelling candidate. And work with his or her gifts. And I think uh, in the case of Donald Trump, he gets his oxygen from being out there with the people, being with the voters. Uh, look, one thing I take issue with, I think what did happen, and we've discussed this early on, at the very end of the race, there were probably more undecideds than in a lot of races before. And we do think because the director of the FBI sent two letters in it, what was a, an unprecedented uh, intervention in the election, uh, total breach of protocol. Yes, I think a lot of those undecideds broke against us, but I don't think that was an inherent problem. And in fact, I would argue without those letters, we would have won those, and, and that's why we would have won the election. You know, the other thing I'd say, I mean, Kelly Ann said it was a joyless campaign. I can test that. You know, we had a lot of fun You're on this joyful. campaign. <laughs> I'm a joyful guy. Hillary's really joyful. We had a lot of fun on the campaign. Did you struggle, everybody who, who knows Hillary Clinton, um, says that the person you see on stage uh, is not the person that you see behind the scenes, that behind the scenes she's, she's a much warmer person, a much more uh, amusing person. Um, did you struggle to get that person from behind the scenes out into the crowd? Look, I, 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 there were a lot of headwinds in this race. You know, we were trying to make history. She's the first uh, woman to be uh, the nominee of a major party. But also, the the, the why Russian... Is that a, why is that a headwind? Why, why is her being a woman a headwind? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, having worked for a few women candidates now, I think that they sometimes face cer certain scrutiny that male candidates don't. Um, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people would talk about the way Hillary spoke during a speech. I didn't hear them remark about male candidates that way. But look, I think the bigger issue uh, is that the Russian intelligence, our, our, our intelligence agencies all confirmed that Russian intelligence stole emails from our campaign chair and from the DNC and selectively leaked them out over months, starting at our Democratic convention, explicitly for the purpose of intervening in the election hurting Hillary Clinton and helping Donald Trump. We faced these headwinds the whole way through. That was tough. And I think it absolutely uh, affected the outcome. And Kellyanne, after you took over, uh, Donald Trump uh, recast or recalibrated two of his more controversial proposals. The uh, ban on Mos the total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering this country until we figure out what the hell is going on, I think is the exact quote, uh, and a deportation force to round up the 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants and remove them from the country. Those, those changed. Um, he never explicitly repudiated them, but they changed in the way that he talked about them, the way that Governor Pence talked about them, the way that you talked about them. Was that part of the reset for the general election? I think it's part of explaining what you meant by what you said and putting it in policy prescription type of uh, language. And that's what he did. So for example, the same day, Jake, that Mr. Trump flew down to Mexico to meet with the Mexican president, he, he chose to accept the invitation. Secretary Clinton did not. 
He then flew to Arizona and gave, again, a 10-point plan on how to reform our immigration system. People may say they don't like it, but at least they can read it. They can examine it. He has one. It's there. He, he delivered it over about 45, 60 minutes. And then, of course, it's, I'm sure it's on the website somewhere. So in that, in that regard, he explained how he would approach the immigration system if he were to be elected. President-elect Trump, without question, offended many minority groups and women who are majority uh, during this election, whether it is mocking a disabled reporter or seeming to question whether Judge Curiel could do his job because of his heritage. Did he ever in private express any regret about that? Because we heard from him on election night a desire to bring the country together. Yes. But that job will be tougher because of some of the things he said mostly before you came on board. So I won't divulge private conversations, but I will tell you that shortly after I came on board, Mr. Trump was in North Carolina and gave a speech. And some people in the media refer to it as the regret speech because toward the middle or the end of it, he talked about, he expressed regret. That was the word he used. He expressed regret for having offended anyone. He said, particularly with my words. And that's, that's a leader, you know, showing humility and inclusiveness and regret to use his word. But I want to say this to you also. If you're talking about just the numbers alone, Donald Trump did better among Hispanics um, and African Americans than did Mitt Romney, John McCain, for example, the last two Republican presidential nominees, Jake. And he did much better among women than almost everybody, certainly everybody publicly predicted. But you've got the first female presidential candidate. She's on the cusp of being the first female president. Where are all these women? Where, where are the marches of women saying, we must have the first female? I didn't see them on Fifth Avenue. I didn't see them in, in Washington, DC. They and were volunteering I, for the campaign. Well, they didn't come out and vote for her, though. <laughs> Let's go to Declan Garvey from Harvard, who has a question from, for Kellyanne. My question has to do with President-elect Trump's communication strategy, uh, specifically if he's going to continue using his uh, Twitter account. I know it breeds a lot of authenticity, um, but he's also been known to, uh, to tweet out falsehoods and, and other uh, liabilities. So is that something that he plans to do after inaugurated? So that's going to be up to him, the Secret Service, and uh, others who have to help decide those issues. I will tell you that uh, the president-elect looks at his social media accounts, a combined 25 million or probably more at this point, users on Twitter and Facebook as a very good platform through which to convey his messages. Um, I can tell you firsthand that there are posts that he makes that otherwise would not be heard or seen by those 25 million people but for him posting them. But, you know, he's a unique person who's been following his instincts and his judgment from the beginning. I think one of the, one of the points that I think we'd all be interested in hearing is in the last week he tweeted that there were millions of fraudulent votes. There's no evidence that there were millions of fraudulent votes. I don't doubt that there were some fraudulent votes. There always are. But the idea that the only reason Hillary Clinton won the popular vote is because of millions of fraudulent votes is not true. Uh, and then when CNN reported on that, he started retweeting people criticizing Jeff Zeleny, our reporter, um, including a 16-year-old boy. Um, and I think the question arises in a room full of people who want President-elect Trump to succeed, who want him to realize a vision where there are more jobs coming into this country, where you do achieve so much of what you want to achieve. Is that really presidential behavior? Well, he's the president-elect, so that's, that's presidential behavior, yes. So the and things I that Bill Clinton did that in the I've Oval Office the that you criticized, that those were presidential? Are you actually comparing what Bill Clinton did in the Oval You're Office You're saying if the president does Twitter it, feed? it's presidential. Shall, I'm we saying, shall we review for those who weren't born then what President Clinton did in I'm the Oval Office? I'm saying just because a president does something doesn't make it presidential. Yes, I wasn't saying otherwise. But the fact is this man is now president of the United States. <laughs> And he's tackling very big issues, the ones that he campaigned on and the ones that he will execute through his one, first 100-day plan. I know him very well. I'm a trusted advisor. He is committed to making good on the promises and on, the, on, the, on frankly, the plans. And he's going to be focused on that. We need to move on and support the president and the initiatives that he's going to, to make. I, I, didn't like, I don't like a lot of things that people in leadership do, but they're there. And that should be respected. I mean, I was raised to respect the office of the president and its current occupant, no matter who he or she is. Jake, I, I just hope moving forward from this campaign, you know, Kellyanne is right. The campaign's over. It's time to move on. 
I just hope the truth doesn't get lost or sacrificed. Welcome back. Clinton campaign officials point to two things they say were out of their control that hurt her campaign. FBI Director Comey's investigation into her private email server during her time at the State Department and those hacks that exposed via WikiLeaks private emails of her campaign chairman and officials at the Democratic National Committee. But did Clinton or any of her top aides bear any responsibility for any of this? Hillary Clinton's private email server first came to light in uh, March 2nd, 2015, a big story in the New York Times. We learned from one of these hacked emails um, published by WikiLeaks that John Podesta, the campaign chairman, sent you an email saying, did you have any idea of the depth of the story? You answered, nope. We brought up the existence of emails in research this summer, but we're told that everything was taken care of. Uh, in other emails, it comes out very clearly that there was a divide between the new guard, you and, and some others, and the old guard. Um, and I'm wondering if you feel that some of the actions and activities that the old guard either allowed to happen, did themselves, or enabled, whether it is giving speeches to Goldman Sachs, or setting up the private email server, or the decision to become multi, multi, multi millionaires. Did the decisions by those individuals, the old guard, make your job close to impossible? Well, no, not at all. Uh, we came very close to winning this campaign. Um, and, and as I said, we, you know, we won the popular vote. Um, look, Hillary said she regretted that email set up, that it was a mistake, she took responsibility for it, and she apologized. No, for I get it, but, like, but, but, you, but, it, but it happened, and it obviously, Sure. You're talking about James Comey. James Comey is in this conversation because of the email server. Sure, but I think, but look, again, if, if any of us on the campaign could have gone back on the time machine, including Hillary Clinton and changed this, absolutely uh, we would have. But I think despite that, this was the most overhyped, overreported, overlitigated story in the history of American politics. Full stop. It was. And particularly because of what James Comey did. You know, there are protocols at, at the Justice Department that they are not to intervene uh, in uh, electoral races. They're not to report out on investigations in you know, two, three, four months uh, before an election. This was a total breach of that protocol and totally unnecessary, particularly to write a letter saying we have some emails, I haven't even looked at them. It, 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 it's it's, it's mind-boggling why he did this. Kellyanne, one of the things that came out um, that has come up in, in conversations after the election is that James Comey might not have felt empowered to do everything he did had the Attorney General Loretta Lynch not recused herself from decision making because Bill Clinton had that meeting with her on an airplane on a tarmac. Do you agree with that premise that Bill Clinton in some ways empowered James Comey? Yes, that is true. That actual meeting between the Attorney General and President Clinton bothered some voters because it just played right into the culture of corruption slash the elite is a different set of rules for them than for the rest of us. I mean, who in the world can do that? Uh, walk across and, and go on and pretend you're talking about the grandchildren for, I don't know, 40, 45, 50 minutes. But I just want to say to lest Jim Comey be the scapegoat of this election, in fairness, in fairness, Hillary Clinton had a very bad time convincing Americans very tough time convincing Americans that she was honest and trustworthy. That was in everybody's polling and that was long before the FBI investigation. You've referred to this as a post-factual election where facts don't matter. Um, and you, you were just taking issue with something that Donald Trump said. Uh, and there were other things, the, the so-called fake news disinformation out there, uh, stories there was a crazy story towards the end of the campaign in which the NYPD was supposedly about to throw Hillary Clinton and her whole gang in jail because of stuff found on Anthony Weiner's computer that linked everybody to child sex trafficking. Just a bizarre story that, interestingly enough, General Flynn retweeted uh, at one point. Um, how much of a problem was this post-factual election in your view? I think it was a huge problem. And I think, look, Jake, I think there's a lot of things we need to examine coming out of this. You just named one of them. Congress has got to investigate what happened with Russia here. We cannot have foreign uh, and foreign aggressors, I would argue, intervening uh, in our elections. And we know that the Russians were promulgating fake news through Facebook and other outlets. But look, we also had, and, and this is with all due respect, you know, to Kellyanne and to her colleagues, this isn't personal, but 
uh, you know, Steve Bannon ran Breitbart News, which was notorious for peddling stories like this. And I'm not attacking him personally, but they they peddled a lot of stories on that website uh, that are just false. They're just not true, and that that reinforced uh, sexist, racist, anti-Semitic. Uh, notions in people, you know, headlines uh, that that just make your that that you know are, are shocking and insulting and 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 shouldn't be part of our public discourse. Kellyanne, well, I think the biggest piece of fake news in this election was that Donald Trump couldn't win. So there's that, and that was uh, peddled probably for weeks and months before the campaign, definitely in the closing days. If you look at major newspapers and major cable stations networks. Jake, it's I, unmistakable. I never said that he couldn't win. I said I it was a competitive race. Well, there's a motion. I didn't say you didn't. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm saying, but particularly print stories. I mean, we have colleagues whom we all respect, some of whom are in this room, that represent outlets. Literally, if you go back, because we have them, and you pull the whole front page. Uh, there's it, a lot of Dewey defeats it's Truman's unbelievable. out there. Absolutely. But that's, that's fake, because it's based on things that just aren't true. They have no path. They have no ground game. She's got more money. She has more personnel. She can't possibly lose. And then, of course, the growing narratives, which I'm not going to, the persistent chronic narratives, which I'm not going to repeat here, but they essentially boil down to Donald Trump takes the wings off of butterflies. And, and that, you know, America said, there's a difference between what may offend me and what absolutely affects me. And I, as a voter, are going to go that way. Are you at all concerned by the fact that intelligence agencies say that Russians were hacking into the email accounts and the email servers of the DNC and John Podesta and that it may have had? I just don't know it to be true. Well, somebody, we no, somebody hacked. Yeah, but Seven, people, people have been going, been going on TV too and saying that the Trump campaign knew this. The Trump campaign was no, involved. I'm not that saying any of that, but the intelligence agencies have testified to that fact. I mean. Uh, it is a fact, Jake. Seventeen. Admiral Mike Rogers, who, who, who said this President like Trump is, is right. interviewing for a potential job, has said it as well. I mean, they're, they're clearly a foreign actor was doing it. Does it just, assuming that it's true? Okay. I don't want to assume that it's true because I don't know it. And you're asking me hypothetical, but you're the one who quoted from WikiLeaks. I didn't. So. Seventeen national security agencies have said this is true. It's true. And, Look, and but I don't understand why you're. It, I don't understand why you're reluctant to acknowledge that the intelligence agencies are saying it. I'm not reluctant to acknowledge that. That's not the question you asked me. But I will tell you that uh, we're not we're not pro uh, foreign government interference. If that's what you're asking. I just I, I got to say this. It's weighing on my conscience. It is outrageous that a foreign aggressor got involved in our election. It has got to be investigated, and it should never ever happen again in our history. The Boston Globe recently ran an op-ed by a woman named Diane Hessen. She was hired by your campaign to study undecided voters in battleground states, to talk to them every week and find out what they were thinking. She wrote that there was one moment more than any other where she saw undecided voters shift to Donald Trump. It was not the Comey letter. It was when Hillary Clinton referred to the basket of deplorables. She made that comment on September 9th. Did you realize at, the at that time that that comment that she made was as potentially damaging as this one study by somebody who worked for your campaign says it was? I, I, first of all, Hillary apologized right away after that uh, and said that she, that she misspoke um, and that she regretted the comment. That's something that Donald Trump wouldn't do. Uh, you know, for, she didn't say that. For, for, she for, said she regretted putting a number on it. She regretted, she regretted, she saying regretted yes. her choice of words. Uh, uh, but Donald Trump never apologized to Keezer Khan. I'm family. talking about Donald Hillary Trump. Clinton right now. Sure, but That's I, what but, they I do. but well, <laughs> you both do it. <laughs> yes, but we won. True. <laughs> no, but I, I think look, you're talking about one instance where Hillary Clinton said one thing. She immediately explained that she regretted. Uh, so you don't think it had an effect? I think she regretted. She regretted getting caught. Let's I, I be think, honest here. I think it definitely could have alienated some voters, and that's mm. why she got out there uh, right away. Uh, look, here's the other thing I will say though. I was proud the day after the election that Hillary Clinton said in her speech that Donald Trump is the president-elect and that he deserves the benefit of the doubt and the chance to lead, and we all need to give him that. Yes, me and Raji from the Harvard Kennedy School has a question for you, Ravi. Uh, thank you so much both for being here tonight. I wanted to ask you a question about whether the Clinton campaign um, was too confident or in some, some might say arrogant throughout this election cycle in a way that might have led to some complacency among voters. We know for a fact that some young people in particular were voting for third party candidates um, and if those votes had gone a different way the, the election could have turned out in a different way. It's their choice where to put their vote so I'm not criticizing or blaming them. I was very frustrated uh, at times when and, and I think Kellyanne and I would agree on this when some 
some news outlets would say the election was a foregone conclusion or would, you know, th this, this um, habit that I think some news organizations got into of assigning a percentage likelihood to win and so on. Um, I think we have to reevaluate that system. But do you think that the Clinton campaign bears any of the responsibility for that impression? that this was a foregone conclusion? Yeah. I do think there's some responsibility because when they were opening up the leads in the public media polling, um, things were said like election day will be over, the election will be over before election day because of the early vote. The well, press it was said call, about specific states. It was said in the press call and early. people <laughs> wrote it like it was the truth without fact checking it or, or verifying it. Welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. Campaigns are often defined by unexpected moments and how the candidates respond. For Donald Trump, his moment came when the Washington Post published this unseen footage from Access Hollywood. Hey, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. So what happened behind the scenes at the campaign after that video was released? How did Donald Trump react? I asked his campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, to take us back to the moment that many observers thought doomed Trump's candidacy. Who told Donald Trump about the tape? Who watched it with him? What was his reaction? Oh, we were in debate prep, and one of the members of the team came in and took some of us, a few of us out, and showed us. We didn't have the tape for a long time. We only had a transcript. And so, but anyway, you know the rest. Donald Trump decided he would like to put out a video apology, and he did that night. And two days later was the, less than two days later, was the second debate in St. Louis. And he carried forward with that. I will tell you, if you look at the polling, that incident affected Donald Trump's numbers much more significantly than the Comey letter affected Hillary Clinton's numbers. That's just a fact. You can go back and look at the, at the data. And there was not early voting really underway on October 7th as opposed to what had already been banked by October 28th. A lot of folks had voted already by the time the Comey letter came out three weeks well, to the day. Probably 80 to 90 percent of the electorate had not yet voted when the Comey but, letter but came out. When the tape came fairness. out, uh, Saturday Night Live had Hillary Clinton popping a bottle of champagne. Yeah, that was ridiculous. Was, was, but was that your reaction? Did you think, oh my God, this is done, this is over? Not at all. That was not, in fact, I remember the, the meeting I was in when that news came out was we were dealing with WikiLeaks. And uh, that was something that our campaign, the, the stolen emails that the Russians were leaking out, we had to deal with that every day, and we stayed focused on that. I thought people, anybody who was popping champagne bottles was uh, uh, just wrong. Uh, and in fact, again, I remember putting, we put out a video two weeks out from election day saying we can lose this race and we got to rally and we got to work hard. I want to move on to the vice presidential decisions. Um, at what point was Bernie Sanders stricken from the list? And the reason I ask is because we know that he was on the list of 39 or so possible contenders. Um, he obviously, obviously generated a great deal of enthusiasm. Um, he obviously reached out to a lot of groups that you um, didn't find easy to reach out, millennials, white working class voters. Um, he won the Michigan primary, he won the Wisconsin primary, two states who ultimately did not win. Why not put him on the ticket? What did Tim Kaine offer that Bernie Sanders didn't? Yeah, it's a great question. And look, Bernie Sanders is a really important part of our campaign no matter what. Um, we would not have had the successful convention that we did without Bernie Sanders' help. Uh, we would not have had as many people support us as did without Bernie Sanders' help. He, he, he was a, an enormous part of our uh, presence on the ground in October uh, in particular, and we're really uh, grateful to him for that. You know, the decision, I think Kellyanne would agree with this, the decision about who should be your vice president should be a decision about who you think is ready to do the job and who you can see as a partner, you know, someone down the hall who you can call on uh, to work with you. Uh, and that's how Hillary approached this, and I assume uh, that's how Donald Trump approached this. Uh, as well, um, and that, and he was on that list because he deserved to be on that list, and he and he was considered fully along with uh, over 30 other people. Uh, but at the end of the day, she felt like Tim Kaine uh, would represent her views and values. If you know, God forbid, he had to become president, uh, that he had uh, the background and preparation uh, to do the job, um, but also that that partnership and that chemistry was the right one. Do you think that Bernie Sanders might have made it a tougher race? Yes. 
And Bernie Sanders, I'd also like to publicly thank Bernie Sanders for his effect on our campaign because uh, he softened up Hillary Clinton. He won 22 states and 13 million voters, and that ain't nothing. Uh, that and that then was worked significant. worked hard to deliver them for Hillary Clinton. Well, I will he add. did, he did. <laughs> but you know, his, I was at the same convention in Philadelphia, the Democratic convention, and the fact is, his supporters were still out there protesting her. He was in the, he was in the hall being. You know, a dutiful Democratic convention soldier, but his his supporters were not. And you saw on election day, if you read the polls, it's still many of them were upset by the way he was treated and the fact that their the views that they took to the table were never really fully assimilated into the Clinton Kane campaign. I assumed her choice of Tim Kane had something to do with Virginia, but it may have had something to do with not being overshadowed. Um, I thought that. He was not a particularly effective pick in the end or at the beginning, and certainly not the vice presidential debate, which was not even close. He interrupted the female moderator about 36 times. Uh, that was not a great moment. And look, I just want to tell you, somebody who was involved in the vice presidential selection process, uh, suggest suggestions anyway. I had worked with Mike Pence for probably 10 years, and he, he had been in Congress for 12 years, 10 of which he sat on the Foreign Affairs Committee, very successful governor of Indiana. We always thought if we were going to bust that blue wall, it would definitely be with the help of a running mate who comes from that area and really allies himself with the concerns of the working class voters. Welcome back. After Hillary Clinton conceded the race to Donald Trump on the phone, we did not see her give a speech shortly thereafter. She waited until the next day for her public concession. What was going on behind the scenes? Why did she wait? I asked Clinton campaign manager Robbie Mocha about the moment that ended Hillary Clinton's bid to become the first woman president. John Podesta came out and spoke to your supporters saying that Hillary Clinton uh, was not going to have any comments that evening. A lot of people were surprised that there was not going to be any seeming closure that evening given the fact that it was apparent that Donald Trump had won. Um, we know now that, that President Obama called Secretary Clinton and said you need to concede. She did call Donald Trump and she did concede. Um, the next morning she was going to give her concession speech. It took a couple hours before she got to the stage and gave the speech, a much celebrated speech praised by everyone. What was going on behind the scenes? Well, little fact checking there. Okay, you know, first please. of all, well, we set the time for that speech the night before. Um, we wanted to give our people time to, to show up and be there and get through security and so on. So the, it, it's not as if that speech was delayed. We, we set that time at maybe four the in the morning. The impression that a lot of us like had that. was, boy, this, she's having a tough time with this. Certainly understandably no. so. No? No. And in fact, some of these reports are, you know, like Kellyanne, I'm not going to get into private conversations that were had. She made the decision to call Donald Trump. No, uh, before. She didn't do that because President Obama she told made, her. She made that decision on her own before she spoke to the president. And, um, and she made it because she believed and she had said during the campaign that, who, that it is important to our democracy that whoever uh, wins, uh, uh, that their opponent uh, concede the election and be supportive uh, of them becoming president-elect. And so she acted in, in good faith with that. And, and that is true. We had arranged ahead of time. Um, we did. How we would speak with each other that night. You had talked before the election. We had emailed and, and agreed. I see an email from Robbie Mook, and I think it's a fundraising email. <laughs> and then I click on, I'm like, it's an email from Robbie. I'm so excited. So you two, um, you two so had actually ne yes, negotiated. Yes, we had. Yes, had and I'm plan. sure that we told we had a little plan, and we actually and we actually that kind of plan. executed yes. on that plan. Yes, I, I looked what down at the... my phone, and it said Uma Abedin. And I said, Oh my God, and uh, and I handed it to Donald Trump, and and he's absolutely right. Secretary Clinton was gracious, but she congratulated Donald Trump, and she also conceded to him, and that's an important point to make here, because. Now you have people participating in a recount, and as the person who was asked 3,462 times on television, Jake, will he respect the election results? Will his supporters I only move asked on? You twice. Okay. I only asked you will twice. his supporters move on? I'd like to pose the question to her supporters. I mean, are you going to accept the election election results? Because hashtag he's your president too, and it, it, I think the right questions were being asked about the wrong candidate and the wrong and, and the supporters. But I am glad Robbie just mentioned that. Because the combination of Secretary Clinton congratulating, conceding, and then telling the American people the next day, let's have the peaceful, I'm, I'm paraphrasing her now, but let's have the peaceful transfer of democracy, let's respect the process and the president-elect. Robbie Mo Kelly and Conway, thank you so much. Thank you. Really